Cassius. Jedi Apprentice. Chapter 7 Cassius and the other students had been moved to a secure bunker built beneath the Jedi Temple. It was normally used to hold supplies, but during emergencies, it could be used as a shelter. Cassius sat in the corner, with a glass of water at his feet, his face buried into his knees as Corbin talked to Master Drolic. Is he going to be okay? I've never seen him like this. We must give him time, Corbin. Sin Drolic tried to reassure the young Jedi. His master was gravely injured tonight. We cannot fault him for wanting to be alone. What's going to happen, Master? I don't know, Sarah. We are awaiting orders from the Council. Clearly, our efforts to keep the temple safe have proved less than fruitful. It may be that you students will be sent with a few of our higher-ranking members off-planet until this matter is resolved. I'm not leaving. Sarah and Master Drolig looked up at Cassius. I'm afraid that choice is not yours to make, Padawan. I said, I'm not leaving. Not until we catch whoever is responsible for this. Cassius, Dravok and his men are doing everything they can to- They're not doing enough! Cassius threw the glass against the wall, shattering it. The other students looked up, shocked at the sudden outburst. If Dravok were doing his job, this wouldn't have happened. Master Takai is hanging on for her life, and several Jedi are dead. Why should I trust him? Watch your tone, Padawan. What would your master say if she saw you acting this way? Throwing a tantrum like a child. I don't know, Master. I would ask her if she was here. But she's not. Because no one is taking action. If Dravok was serious about helping, he would have taken his men to the lower levels and brought these criminals to justice. That's enough out of you, Padawan. Not another word or you'll answer to the council. Cassius glared at Master Drolik, his face hot with anger. You would do well to sit and think. Your anger is leading you down a dangerous road. Do not let it lead you down that path, lest you become the very evil a Jedi should oppose. Cassius returned to the corner of the room, sitting and seething with anger and frustration. Sarah and Corbin looked at each other worried. Before long, temple guards escorted the students to the briefing room with the other masters. Dravok stood, talking to Master Windu before turning his attention to the crowd. This evening has seen the last attack on this temple. After a grueling interrogation with one of the attackers, we've determined a few possible locations of the Trandoshan compound here on Coruscant. Unfortunately, we require more information from our esteemed guests to determine where exactly it is. The Senate has been informed of everything we've learned, and by week's end, we will have justice for every Jedi who has fallen in these attacks. Until then, students will remain in the temple under lockdown. Guards have been posted at every entrance and exit. Security droids have also been stationed around the temple, constantly on guard for any intruders. Lessons and classes are postponed until the threat to our safety has been dealt with. Now, return to your quarters and trust in the Force. The briefing ended. Cassius and the other Padawans were led from the room to their quarters. Cassius sat on his bed, not sleeping the entire evening. The next morning, Cassius received a transmission on his comlink. The doctors working in the medical bay were able to stabilize Master Takai's vitals. He would be escorted soon by a temple guard to see her. Upon arriving, he saw several empty beds where the other injured Jedi spent their last moments. Cassius walked to the bedside of Master Takai and sat next to her. He could finally see the extent of the damage. A large pad of gauze was secured over her right eye, covering a large cut. Her hands and arms had been severely burned and were wrapped up tightly. Her hair was still damp, no doubt from spending the evening in a bacta tank. There was no other way around it. She looked horrible. Considering the alternative, however, Cassius was glad she was alive. He sat closer, tears welling in his eyes. I'm sorry, Master. I promise, I will figure something out. As Cassius sat, a hand rested on his shoulder. Cassius looked up and saw Sarah, with Corbin close by. This is, this is terrible. I'm sorry, Cassius. Sarah, Corbin, I think we need to do something. What do you mean? Cassius got closer, 
He knew the guard was on the other side of the room waiting for them. I think we need to try and stop this. If we can get outside the temple after dark, this gives us at least eight hours to find these Trandoshans. I agree. Drabok has been taking far too long to bring these attacks to an end. Wait, you're serious? We can't do that. We'll get expelled or worse killed. Besides, how would we even sneak out? And what happens when we do? We don't know where these guys are. Corbin, you've spent plenty of time with Dravok these past few months. Surely you have some information. I mean, yeah, a bit. I have a plan for getting past the guards. The problem will be the security droids. They have them stationed all over. Windows, air vents, you name it. Corbin, you're the one who's good with droid tech. If you can figure out a weakness we can exploit, we can get past them. Finding a speeder shouldn't be too difficult once we're outside the temple. I think I can help out there when we get to it. But we don't know where to look. We have, what, maybe seven hours to search the lower levels to find them? We're going into this blind. Not exactly. The other night, I overheard Dravok talking to his comlink. He mentioned Trandoshans on level 1313. 1313? That's the most notorious crime-ridden place on the planet. We can't just waltz in as Padawans and not attract attention. We can take our robes and conceal ourselves. We'll stay hidden as much as possible. Think of this as reconnaissance. Corbin sighed and looked around. Okay, suppose we make it and find out where they are. What happens then? We can't just tell Dravok that we left the temple to find the Trandoshans. We can leave an anonymous tip. We get in there, find the compound, and head back. After that, Dravok and his men can handle the rest. Uh, I don't know. This seems wrong. Corbin, I thought the same thing. But things have escalated too much for us to just sit and wait. Dravok said they're still looking for the exact location. Who knows how long that'll take? The next attack could happen at any time, and every minute we wait is a minute bringing us closer to danger. I guess you're right. When do we do this? Tonight. After dark. At eight. Set your chronometers. Meet at my room. Corbin, try to find a way past those droids. Right. Sarah, you're sure you can get us a speeder? Yes. One way or another. Okay. Everyone get going. We need to prepare. Sarah and Corbin left the room as Cassius took one more look at his master. There's no way she would approve of this. But he had to do it. If he didn't try, he wouldn't forgive himself. Cassius was escorted to his room. There he sat, preparing his robe, utility belt, and anything else he might need before lying in bed, awaiting the hour. He woke up to his chronometer beeping. Ten minutes to showtime. He readied his gear and waited. Within fifteen minutes, there was a knock at his window. Sarah was there on the ledge with Corbin. Cassius opened his window. How did you guys get here without alerting the droids? Corbin held up one of the small deactivated droids. I managed to rig a pulse generator from my hollow projector. Basically, if I get close enough, I can send out a high-frequency signal that shorts them out. See? Told you you could do it. Just gotta be careful. Too many charges, and it could short out and detonate. Good work, Corbin. Thanks. Now, can we get off this ledge and onto solid ground? Right. Follow me. Cassius stepped onto the ledge, leading his friends towards the old ladder that scaled to the top of the temple. They climbed the ladder, keeping an eye out for more security droids. Do you see anything, Cassius? No. No droids or guards. I don't think they figured anyone would come up here. Come on. The three young Jedi made it to the roof, making sure to keep a low profile as they perched at the edge of the temple, overlooking the steps below and guarding the steps. Four temple guards. Great. How do we get down there without breaking our necks? Simple. Grappling cables. Those cables aren't long enough to reach the ground. This was your plan? No, they won't reach the ground. But if we go down one by one, the three cables should be just long enough that we can land safely. This is insane. I can't believe I'm doing this. Believe it, Corbin. So, who wants to go first? Sarah and Corbin looked around, avoiding eye contact with Cassius, who let out an exasperated sigh. <sighs> All right, 
I'll go first. Follow my lead. Remember, only one person on a cable at a time. These are older models, so they'll only hold one person at a time. Taking the three cable launchers, Cassius aimed the cable at the edge with the first and fired. The hooked cord shot into the stone of the temple wall and hooked on. Cassius looked down below as a lump formed in his throat. If any of these cables broke, getting caught would be the least of his problems. Slowly, Cassius started to rappel downward, Sarah and Corbin keeping watch from above. Foot by foot, he continued to lower himself until the cable reached its limit. Grabbing the next grappling cable, Cassius launched it into the stone, once again hooking on securely as he continued lowering himself. By this point, he was about 150 feet from the steps below. It then dawned on him. They would have to distract the temple guards. Cassius looked up and saw Sarah on her way down. He'd have to think as he moved. Attaching the final hook, Cassius continued slowly lowering himself. He was now 50 feet from the steps below, and the cable had given the last of its cord. Cassius was now hanging. Looking up, he saw Sarah looking down at the guards and Corbin nearing the second cable. Cassius attached the cable to his belt and looked into his pouches for anything he could use to get the guards' attention. Then he remembered Corbin's hollow projector. Cassius started climbing back towards Sarah and Corbin. Well, how do we distract them? I've got an idea. Corbin! Corbin looked down, feeling very uneasy about the entire mission. Yeah? Still have that hollow projector thing? What about it? Toss it down. I have an idea. Corbin nodded, removing the projector from his pouch and carefully lowered it to Sarah with the force. Sarah then handed it to Cassius. What are you going to do? He said this thing can only handle a few charges before it shorts out and detonates. I'm going to short it out and toss it away from the steps. The explosion will be small, but it should get their attention. Either that or I'll lose my fingers. Please don't. That's going to make climbing down a lot more difficult. Well, here goes nothing. Get ready to make our escape. Cassius activated the projector, which emitted a small, high-pitched whine. He then clicked it again and again until the whine turned into a glitching beep. This was it. Cassius threw the projector off to the left of the temple steps. As it hit the ground, the projector exploded, creating a soft but clearly audible explosion. The guards suddenly shot their heads toward the sound and rushed over to investigate. Cassius then slid and jumped the rest of the way down, using the force to cushion his landing. He then signaled to Corbin and Sarah, who quickly rappelled down and jumped as well. Come on! They'll be back any second! The three Padawans rushed down the temple steps and down towards the docking bay. Okay, now we need a speeder. Sarah, you're up. Follow me, and stay quiet. There's bound to be more security droids in the area. They followed Sarah, hiding behind crates and boxes until they saw a green and black speeder, locked up with two security droids guarding it floating around the speeder looking out for any signs of possible thieves. That must be the Trandoshan speeder they confiscated after the attack. Sarah, can you get it free? Maybe. We'll have to deal with those droids first. Great. How are we going to do that? Corbin looked closely. These droids aren't programmed for combat. Sarah, how quickly can you get that speeder free? I'll need about two minutes. Okay. Cassius and I will create a distraction while you sneak over. While they're looking for us, do whatever you need to do. Hurry, though. If they spot anyone in the vicinity, they're programmed to sound the alarm. Sarah nodded as Corbin grabbed a repair tool from a nearby crate and threw it, hitting a nearby traffic antenna on the docking bay. The two droids looked at each other and flew over to the antenna, scanning the area. Okay, Sarah, go! Sarah quickly and silently rushed to the speeder and activated her lightsaber, quickly slicing through the speeder lock that was keeping it chained down. Suddenly, one of the droids looked up, hearing the sound, and started moving back to investigate. It's going towards her. We need to give her time. Cassius grabbed one of the food capsules off his belt and threw it, whizzing by the droid who immediately turned and looked towards the crates where Cassius and Corbin were hiding. The droid began to hover over, activating the security light. Cassius and Corbin crouched down, staying completely still as the droid crept closer. Cassius looked around, and on the box of tools next to them, he noticed a fusion torch. Quickly grabbing it, he waited as the droid was soon right over their heads. 
Cassius quickly shot up and activated the torch, jamming it between the droid's eyes as it short-circuited and fell to the ground with a clang. The other droid heard and quickly started making its way over. Sarah quietly worked on the speeder, and soon, she was able to activate it. As the droid got closer and closer, it noticed the deactivated droid on the floor. Just as it was about to sound the alarm, Sarah rammed into the droid with the speeder, knocking its head off and sending it tumbling aside. That was too close. Get in. The Jedi pupils hopped in the speeder as Sarah quickly sped them away from the temple. Where to now? The underworld portal. That's our entrance to the lower levels. And what do we do once we get there? Keep a low profile and see if we can gather any information on the Trandoshan compound. Ugh, I have a bad feeling about this. Yeah, me too. But it's too late to turn back. We have to see this through. The speeder cruised through the crisp night air. Soon, the temple was out of sight, and they came upon an enormous round opening built into the city, like a large hole leading down into empty darkness. There it is. Let's go. Sarah carefully flew the speeder downwards into the portal, trying to fly as casually as possible. Cassius looked around. There were speeders and cargo freighters moving in and out of different hangars. Soon, they reached the entrance to level 1313, and Sarah landed the speeder. Hey, you can't park your speeder here. They looked to their left and saw a fat, sloppily dressed deck officer. Sorry, uh, where can we park? The deck officer looked at them with squinted eyes. You're not from around here, are you? There's a docking area up ahead. It's 50 credits to park. We don't have that kind of money. Well, then you don't park, do you? Cassius reached into his pouch, pulling out his comlink, and tossed it to the officer. Here, won this in a game of sabak. You let us park here, it's yours. Hmm. Authentic Jedi gear, huh? All right, you got five hours. If you ain't back by then, your speeder will be junked and sold. Fair enough. Keeping their hoods up, the Padawans exited the speeder and walked through the many gates and doors leading to the lawless urban jungle that awaited them. Stepping through the entrance gate, they looked around. The stars were no longer overhead, and the stench of speeder exhaust and grime filled the air as they looked around at the unkempt shops and marketplaces that lined the crowded streets. Well, welcome to level 1313.